I'm delighted to be joined now by uh, George Rees Fino from uh, Breakthrough Breast Cancer Research Centre at the uh, Institute of Cancer Research. George, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. It's my pleasure. Now, how important is genetic profiling in the battle against uh, breast cancer? Well, the approaches that we currently use to manage breast cancer patients have proven to be successful. Okay. We have seen a steady decline in the mortality of breast cancer patients in the last 20 years. But the fact of the matter is that there's still a huge population of breast cancer patients that receive chemotherapy but derive little, if any, benefit from, from this type of approaches. So the development of genomic classifiers that could actually tell us which patients would not need chemotherapy because their outcome, uh, outcomes were so good well, that would be a fantastic thing. And that's one of the main contributions of microarrays so far for our understanding of breast cancer. Uh, in particular, the development of prognostic gene signatures. So George, have you got all the results that you were looking for? Have you gone as far as you can with this particular work? Well, there are several ways of approaching the contribution of microarrays. From a, let's say, theoretical perspective, microarrays have been instrumental in changing the way we perceive breast cancer. For instance, some years ago, we always perceived breast cancer as a, a single disease with variations in terms of histology, clinical presentation, and outcomes. Now we have realized that breast cancer is a collection of completely different diseases that happen to affect the same anatomical site and originate in the same microanatomical structure. Other than that, those diseases uh, are not similar anymore. It, this, is in particular, it, this is particularly the case for ER positive, estrogen receptor positive, and estrogen receptor negative breast cancers. The two diseases are fundamentally different. The other contribution of microarrays was in the development of this, these prognostic gene signatures. Um, they actually have helped us a, a great deal in identifying the patient population that may be spared from the toxic side effects of chemotherapy because they will not benefit from this type of approach. Now, one of the problems or limitations of our research endeavors in, in regards to the use of microarrays in clinical practice has been the development of predictive signatures or genomic classifiers that could tell us which patients would benefit from specific therapeutic agents. In that realm, microarrays have not been as successful. So George, what are the limitations of the use of microarray? As we discussed, the predictive signatures have been a problem, but there's another issue that's largely forgotten by the microarray enthusiasts. That is the fact that even these prognostic signatures that have been incredibly successful are limited in the type of information they provide because most of them, at the end of the day, are a measure of proliferation in tumors. So recent meta-analysis or reanalysis of microarray studies and also comparison of results of microarrays with traditional pathology have demonstrated that information provided by first-generation prognostic signatures above and beyond the information provided by assess the assessment of estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2, and K67 may be limited. That emphasizes a very important point here, that not only we should strive to develop let's say genomic classifiers, but also we have got to be able to implement optimized and standardized pathology. That's something that we should never forget, that pathology provides very good prognostic information as well. So George, what are the next steps? How can you be more successful in your predictive work? In regards to the development of predictive classifiers, those classifiers that all of us clinicians want to have in the clinic, um, perhaps microarrays may not be the optimal tool because resistance to specific therapeutic agents may be caused by a huge number of different, well, let's say, genetic or epigenetic alterations, some of which may not cause a change in gene expression. And in that case, microarrays will not be helpful. But what we have learned from microarrays is very likely to prove instrumental for us to develop the next generation of genomic classifiers based on the novel technologies that have just emerged, such as massive par uh, massively parallel sequencing, uh, also known as next generation sequencing. Now we have the opportunity of combining the assessment of tumors in terms of histopathology, 
gene expression, but also genetics. And I think the combination of all of these approaches together may lead to the development of this type of predictors that we need so much. This is a period of radical technological uh, change. What are some of those technologies out there, and when do you think we can see some of those results? The answer here, Stephen, is a simple one, that um, technology has never progressed at this space. And also the scientific community, after the stories from microarrays, have come to terms with the idea that we have to work together, that there won't be a way of a single individual being able to understand every single aspect of these high throughput studies. So now there, there, there are two large consortia which are investigating breast cancers from a complete genomics perspective, uh, the International Cancer Genome Consortium and the Cancer Genome Atlas. And these two together will profile more than 25,000 cancers in the next five years. So I think by the time this exercise is completed, we'll have a completely different perception of breast cancer. George, thank you very much indeed for taking the time out to, to talk to us today. Thank you. My pleasure.